All right. Well, welcome everybody to the wonderful book launch of Charlie Winninger's book, Listening to Ecstasy. Yes, I bought $2 worth of confetti for that one joke. I also included a soundtrack. Yeah, that's what it's like. Feels less like I'm talking into a void. So I'm going to be vamping for just a little bit while people stream in uh, for just the next couple of minutes. Thank you guys so much for making time out of your busy Friday nights, although for all of you in New York, you got a 10 p.m. curfew. So what else were you going to do? Um, there will be a chat on the side. Please, please make use of that. Uh, there will be a Q&A afterwards. So uh, we will be checking that. Um, so yeah. All right, so um, after thanking you guys, I want to say um, I hope you're all surviving the pandemic all right. It's been a very tough time for a lot of people because frankly, we finally had to admit that there was something CBD can't fix. And that's been really tough for so many people. I will say um, ketamine has been really useful for when you need to socially distance from yourself. Just a pro tip for all you psychonauts. Um, you know, Charlie was really thoughtful this week in the way that he arranged uh, this whole uh, psychedelic sweep in the elections. Yeah, it was a promotional thing just for the book, actually. So we're really grateful to you, Charlie, for that promo. Thank you for helping us legalize medical mushrooms. I'm a big fan of mushrooms because they can cure depression, addiction, anxiety, OCD, and even acute ABFNBOM acute boredom from not being on mushrooms. And to be honest, this week, it kind of looks like it's the end of the war on drugs and the drugs have won. And maybe it'll be nationwide soon. I think that Congress could probably pass a joint resolution, but if first they pass a joint. I personally support like a more tactical Full approach of an eye for an eye justice. Like, you know, if I'm caught selling mushrooms, then I should be forced to have mushrooms sold to me. That just seems like fair. I've been very pro-drug decriminalization, uh, frankly, because I hate drug deals, um, or more specifically that they're called deals, because um, drugs are actually very expensive and there usually aren't any deals. So that name's a little misleading. Um, I also think we really need to change high school drug education because the most harmful and nefarious myth about drug use is that people are always giving to it for free. Actually, most of the time they charge you and it's pretty expensive. As a matter of fact, I feel like people do cocaine on mirrors just to feel like they have twice as much cocaine. Anyway, I am excited uh, for drugs to be legalized because once psychedelics are legal, uh, we can all finally stop having to use the metric system. And I think that's a really bright future for us all to look forward to. Um, personally, I am a huge fan of MDMA, the subject of tonight's book launch party. Um, and, you know, it would be really convenient right now if MDMA were discovered as the cure for COVID-19. And just as one data point, I have tried MDMA and I have never died from COVID. So maybe there's a correlation. Although I did actually get COVID in March and I still can't smell anything. Uh, but I prefer to think of it less as a loss of smell for my nose and more as a sensory deprivation tank for my nose. Kind of silver lining. Um, MDMA is a great treatment and preventative medicine. You can give vets MDMA to cure their PTSD from wars or you can give ordinary people MDMA to stop those wars from happening. MDMA is helpful uh, as a reminder that the self is an illusion. Uh, another helpful thing to remind you that the self is an illusion is trying to remember your answer to the password security question, what's your favorite song? Very difficult to remember that. The self is an illusion. <laughs> Um, it's a great time to be talking about transformations, which is ultimately what this book is about. Um, transformations can be difficult, as we've seen this week. You know, these past few weeks, we've seen the nation transitioning uh, administrations. We're transitioning towards a vaccine slowly. And this nation overwhelmingly voted to decriminalize drugs. And boy, what a transformation that will be. So on to Charlie's book, Listening to Ecstasy. 
This is really ultimately a love poem to MDMA, to Shelley Winninger, and to love itself. Um, you know, I wanted, I was reading this actually recently, and I was trying to um, highlight the parts that were really important and significant, and um, this is what happened. So just maybe don't even try. Uh, <laughs> You know, this book reminds me of like the eyes of the Mona Lisa painting that from any angle, it always seems to be constantly directed at you personally. I found this book was like a lot like MDMA itself. It sold as a fun party adventure book, but really it's a gateway book into self-help. And it covers really important themes we'll get into later. So please get prepared with your questions about MDMA. It's a self-help book. It's a love poem. It's a how-to guide, it's a eulogy, it's a prayer. It's probably a forthcoming movie. I don't know, you know, we'll see about that. And I, we're all here, frankly, to celebrate the author. So with no further ado, everybody, please put your hand, hands together spiritually, since we can't hear you, for the wonderful, beautiful, amazing Charlie Winninger. Charlie! <laughs> Hi. Um... Thank you, Sarah, for that uh, wonderful introduction. That, that, the way you describe the book, I, I should I should read it. Um, so um, I'm going to do a, a couple of readings tonight from the book before we get to other speakers. And this first reading is from the prologue. When I found myself on fire in my life, to the point where I've started approaching burnout, I've learned to follow an old adage, stop, drop, and roll. I then carve out time, usually weeks in advance, to stop my life's merry-go-round for a day, drop some MDMA, and allow the roll, the MDMA experience, to replenish my being. I call this responsible recreational drug use. The very notion seems might seem counterintuitive to the reader's acculturated ears as it once did to mine. But for the community I've discovered and that my wife Shelley and I have helped nurture over the past 15 years here in New York, the responsible middle way between abstention and abuse, the middle way is the way to a fuller life. We found that having a mature and fact-based fact -based approach to using MDMA to be of enormous benefit to us. Potentially one of the world's most beneficial psychoactive sub chemicals, and one that almost always bestows a secret smile upon its users, MDMA is a much maligned and misunderstood compound. But in fact, it's a sheep in wolf's clothing. It's an exotic chemical with a devoted esoteric following and its benefits are a well-kept open secret. Indeed, the closer one gets to MDMA, the better it looks. What makes it an, un an uncanny chemical is its versatility. It has been shown in clinical trials to bring profound and lasting relief to the suffering uh, of those uh, who suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, such as victims of sexual violence and traumatized soldiers back from Iraq. It can also help a couple trying to reclaim the lost heart of their relationship. Yet the same substance at the same dosage can be used at an all night rave to dance ecstatically with a thousand others in unified wild abandon. Is there another substance on the planet that can claim such a range of, applica of applications? Although there is much to say about MDMA as a powerful medicine with promising applications, this is not a book about the chemistry or the science, but of human chemistry. It's a story of how this substance has provided a pleasurable backdrop to a full life as well as to a happy and healthy marriage, one that's been celebrated twice in the New York Times. Shelley and I would have done fine without MDMA, but slowly, over time, it's not only helped our marriage and improved our overall quality of life, it's also opened a door to a hidden underground world 
where uh, that 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 we'd otherwise never have known was there. A whole community, wonderful friends, and a second childhood to boot. Not a small surprise for two senior citizens dreading the aging process. MDMA can point the person inward or outward. Shelley and I and those in our community have found it to be the chemical of connection with oneself or another. It's helped imbue our lives with a renewed sense of purpose, meaning, and joy. This book is also my coming out of the closet story. This includes how I have struggled with feelings of shame about my drug use in the past, but have overcome that to embrace a healthy self-regard, even pride about my explorations. I've come to believe that such exploration can be fun and that fun is essential for mental health and well-being. Indeed, joy, play, fun, pleasure are all potentially transformational experiences. Recreational drug use, when done responsibly, may be more frivolous than clinical research, yet it can be more profound than one might think. As responsible adults, many of us tend to trivialize and devalue recreation. But these days in particular, as I find my free time melting away like a polar ice cap, with reality slapping me in the face every time I flip on a screen, and the world looking like it's about to explode with fear and hatred, I say, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures and pleasures. So in the face of this onslaught, we've found MDMA to be a nectar for the neurons, a tonic for the tense. And as a hardworking dude now in his early 70s, rolling is not only a way of balancing my life, but of celebrating it as well. In other words, it's time for some serious fun. Your audience right now is going wild. That's what they sound like. That's, that's the real, real audio. Um, <laughs> that was a beautiful reading, Charlie. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you about your book, sort of like uh, bird's eye view perspective things of your wonderful book. Um, the first question I have is, uh, so your book is called Listening to Ecstasy. And in a nutshell, what did ecstasy have to say to you? I, uh, how much time do you have, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> um, how much time do we have to kill? You know, I, I tell you what it has to say to me these days, um, with all the world, what's going on in the world, it's saying, Charlie, yeah, you can get all worried about it, but that's not going to do you any good. And you know what? Things have worked out for you in your life. That's what it said to me. I don't know what it says to anybody else. But for me, it reminds me that worry is, uh, is not a good way to spend my time. And that um, uh, if I look at the big picture of my whole life, uh, I have been much safer and uh, well taken care of by the universe than I ever expected. And so that's one thing it said to me. And it's also said to me, enjoy the now, because it brings me into the hyper now uh, and gets me really rooted in the moment. And as a preparation for meditation for me in that way. So um, those are a couple of things it says. It also said, wrote, write a best-selling book. I'm sure it was one of those things. Um, <laughs> So speaking of everybody here by the book, uh, next question. Um, so my favorite part of the book was the way you legitimize joy. Um, why do you think we've learned as a society to invalidate happiness? Well, um, I think we've learned that, uh, first of all, that um, we, we might, some people might consider happiness to be akin to uh, naivete and um, many of us have become cynical in these years. Um, but I found that uh, uh, there's still room for happiness. Uh, there's so much to be grateful for and that makes me happy. And when I do things that are meaningful, that makes me happy. 
Uh, and also, uh, I, I think that happiness might be devalued in the culture at large because people don't really feel in their heart of hearts that they deserve it. Um, but we do, it's our birthright. And MDMA helps me remember that. One of my favorite parts of your book was where you talk about um, cynicism is certainty, whereas optimism is uh, you're taking a chance and humans crave certainty so much that they'll choose cynicism over optimism. That really kind of rang out to me. Um, and the way you can legitimize joy as like a very esteemed therapist um, really spoke to me. So I appreciate that part. Um, my next question is, how has your book been received so far? At several points in the book, you refer to, you know, coming out of the closet. And for a moment, I'm very worried for Shelley. And then you talk about how it's the chemical closet uh, and that you're uh, worried about its reception. And so I'm curious, how did that, how did reality meet your expectations about coming out of the chemical closet? So far, so good. Um, <laughs> I, I did it slowly I, um, as I was writing the book to friends and to family and uh, even to a couple of patients when it was uh, appropriate to do so. Uh, and I was shocked at the lack of negativity uh, coming that I think it's because we're in a new phase of, re, of, of things now. And if it was five or 10 years ago, it might be different. Uh, and with the book coming out, um, I have gotten uh, only, uh, only good feedback and people seem to be, if I might toot my own horn a little, uh, I seem to be surprised because the subtitle is The Transformative Power of MDMA and it make it, make it sound like a very serious treatise on MDMA, but it's not, uh, it's, it's serious at times, but it's, it's really, a, the book is really a celebration. And so people are surprised when they read it, they said, oh, it's really like an easier read than they expected it to be and, uh, and, uh, and a more upbeat one. Absolutely. Um, I can definitely see that um, coming out of the closet being slightly easier than anticipated because the times have changed quite a lot. Um, all right, penultimate question for you. Um, your book covers a lot of themes. Specifically, it covers the themes of aging, uh, love, mental health, political idealism, science, the science of uh, psychedelics, and a lot of practical wisdom about taking psychedelics. What was the hardest part of the book for you to write? Uh, I guess the hardest part was the, uh, the, the, the practical, and I have a whole chapter on a guide to safe use. Uh, and that was uh, difficult to write because I wanted to get it just right because I want only accurate information there, of course, uh, how to uh, look at what the risks are, how to minimize the risks or uh, and maximize the benefits and who should not do it under any circumstances like uh, a heart patient or somebody with epilepsy um, or a pregnant woman. Um, uh, I wanted to get all the facts right. So I really, uh, really, uh, uh, obsessed over it for a long time to make sure every fact was exactly right. Gotcha. So my last question uh, for you is just, was it hard writing this entire book while rolling hard on MDMA <laughs> the entire time? I wish I could have done that. <laughs> the only drug I used uh, for, for, this, for the time I was in front of the computer writing was actually dark chocolate. Um, which is okay. a potent, potent drug, um, uh, especially when it's 100% raw chocolate. Um, don't try this at home, kids. But uh, um, uh, oh, you went for that pure stuff, 100%. Wow, yeah, that's yeah, some hardcore. Sweet, sweet intravenous chocolate right there. Um, <laughs> uh, well, that was. Um, uh, thank you for answering my questions, Charlie. Uh, I do want to mention to all of the attendees that uh, you should really stick around, um, not just because we're about to hear from some psychedelic luminaries, but because there's going to be a special giveaway at the end or a reveal about how Charlie is going to virtually sign your books. It's like a magic show, um, a socially distant signing, as well as a Q&A a little bit with the panelists. So if you have questions, 
write them in on the side. And uh, Monica, the woman running this, will pin your question, reach out to you if you're willing to uh, come on screen to ask your question at the end of the meeting. So questions in the side. I don't know if I'm on the right side to be pointing this way, but they're over here. Anyway, <laughs> so let's get on to stories of how MDMA transformed my life. I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who is one of my favorite people in the world, um, tied with all the other panelists. <laughs> Um, and frankly, if you're here because you like books, this next highly prolific <laughs> guest is for you. <laughs> Dr. Julie Holland is a psychiatrist, a psychopharmacologist, and author of the New York Times bestseller, Moody Bitches and Weekends at Bellevue. She's the editor of two nonprofit books, Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, and The Pot Book, A Complete Guide to Cannabis. While now a medical advisor to MAPS, she was a medical monitor for several clinical studies examining the efficacy of using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or cannabis in the treatment of PTSD. After buying Charlie's book, uh, please make sure to buy her new book, Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. Julie, Julie Holland, take it away. Hello, I'm a luminary. I'm so ex am I illuminating? Can anyone see me illuminating? I think I might be. Um, this is all about Charlie's book and Charlie and Shelley. And the first thing I wanna say is thank you for having me. And also thank you for cultivating our psychedelic community so well, Charlie, all these years. Uh, I still remember those very early emails about potlucks in Brooklyn for those who are sort of maps oriented. So thanks for sponsoring them. Um, and I, I do see in the chat actually that I do look luminous, so that's great. Thanks so much for that feedback and validation. Um, okay, it's 1985, picture it. It's the summer of 85. Simple Minds and Tears for Fears are the big bands. Um, Huey Lewis was singing about the power of love and Phil Collins was singing a song called Susudio and we still have no idea what that was about. Um, and I was in a band. I had a uh, very short hair that sort of spiked up because it was the 80s. And I had a very uh, pen and paper and just taking notes. What time did I take it? What happened? Did my eyes, pupils dilate? You know, always the researcher. Um, and I definitely still have my earliest notes from the very first time I took MDMA. And the thing that I remember the most was the quiet. For the first time in my life, my head was quiet. The, the little voice that's ta -ta 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 was just stopped. And for a while, I really didn't do a damn thing, but just luxuriate in the, the silence. I finally had silence in my head. It was thrilling. Then the next thing I noticed was that as I was writing notes and thinking, I was thinking at the same rate of my note taking. I didn't have to like rehearse my thoughts or stop my thoughts to get the writing down. I was perfectly synchronized. My note taking and my thoughts were perfectly synchronized, flowing. Thoughts were just flowing from my brain, out my arm, writing, writing, writing. I wrote like 30 pages, <laughs> like front and back, so much writing. Uh, and it was all this sort of uh, self-analysis. And it was really the first time, even though I had taken mushrooms before, or I'd taken LSD before, there was something about this where I really could see the whole lay of the land and uh, all my different sort of facets of my personalities and all the pathology. It was just like so easy to, to see all of it. And it was really like, like, a, like a veil had been lifted. It was the first time that I ever did any kind of self-analysis. Um, and it was very good for me. And it also, a, a couple of things came out of that. When my brain was quiet, I realized this really could be a medicine for people who have auditory hallucinations. If it's making my brain this quiet, imagine what it would do for other people whose brains are really noisy. And I still have this very strong intuition that in the right circumstances, MDMA could be really helpful to people with schizophrenia. So that was my first big takeaway. Um, and I had several other takeaways that um, I wrote about a little bit and uh, I don't, I don't want to get into it. I will just say that, um, you know, they're my epiphanies. They're very good for my own growth. Uh, I met Rick shortly after he came to visit me at Penn. He may want to tell you that story or he may have another story. Um, we took MDMA together the very last day that it was legal to do so in the United States of America. Um, and Rick was helping me with a few issues I had here and there. Um, 
anyway, I I'm not going to get too into that, but I also want to say a couple more things about how MDMA was very helpful for me. The whole other scenario was not uh, taking it alone or taking it with one person and doing a little bit of psychotherapy, but um, as Charlie was describing, taking it at a rave, taking it when other people are also taking it and everyone is together dancing on the dance floor. And uh, so I had some of these experiences in the late 80s, early 90s uh, in Philadelphia and in New York City. Uh, I went to raves in Philly when I was a medical student. I went to raves uh, in like downtown and Brooklyn and all kinds of crazy places when I was a psychiatric resident. Um, and just that feeling of uh, elation and oneness, you know, and that connection with with the other revelers, um, it's still when I can tap into that now, and it completely feeds my soul. This this tremendous sense of joy and unity and connection um, that was good for me. I want it for other people. And then the the other way that I found MDMA very helpful is in the context of um, relationship repair let's say, and mending, mending fences, you know, uh, dyads are all about rupture and repair. We do things to piss each other off and to hurt each other. And then we come around and we apologize. I only said this because you said that. And, um, you know, there's a certain amount of ledgering and tit for tat kind of uh, balancing that can happen in a relationship. And, and when both people take MDMA and um, I'm just reading the chats. They're very distracting. When two people have taken MDMA, I'm almost done. Um, the defenses are down. The openness and bonding is up. The oxytocin is up. Um, and this, uh, what, what Anne Shulgin referred to as emotional ledgering, which is this idea of sort of keeping score, you know, that you do in a relationship and, you know, you're going to do that. I'm going to do this to you. And this, this sort of one upping and the MDMA in a, in a, and the dyad al allows you to just throw the ledger out and get down to the deeper issues and really uh, what you need, uh, what you're willing to give the other person, um, recommitting to the relationship. So over the years, every once in a while, I have found it very useful, sort of like fertilizer or like some sort of a, a patch spackle kit to sort of repair some of the damage that's been done um, to renew a commitment to grow together. Um, and that is all I want to say about my experiences right now. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Julie, for the absolutely gorgeous uh, testament. Um, I very much relate to the quiet mind uh, aspect of your, your first journey. I definitely relate to that. It reminds me of one of the first times I took MDMA. I was at this heady conference filled with psychedelic luminaries who were all supposed to be anonymous. So you weren't supposed to identify them. And this woman came over to me and I was so excited. I just went, holy shit, you're Julie Holland. <laughs> and um, uh, Charlie was there and he just went so much for anon anonymity. Um, so anyway, I know MCs aren't supposed to- I totally um, remember that. <laughs> okay. I'm glad. Okay, moving on. Um, our next guest uh, is a new friend of mine, Sheila Burgle was born in Iran, raised in New York, and was sworn in as a US citizen by the very late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She has dedicated her life to championing women in music, and she works as a DJ, music writer, and host of a weekly radio show called Sophisticated Boom Boom on WFMU, the longest running freeform radio station in the US. Everybody, please telepathically put your hands together for Sheila Burgle. Oh, that's a drum roll. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, and I'm very happy to be amongst all you psychedelic luminaries, and Charlie and Shelly, congratulations on this momentous occasion. I'm so happy to be here sharing. I'm going to get a little bit serious because I, I like to tell my story in a very personal way um, because MDMA is the single most important thing that I've ever done in my life. And it begins in a dentist's office in 2013. I went in for a lousy tooth extraction and I was given nitrous oxide. And on the nitrous oxide, I was put in touch with a higher power. And as someone who never grew up with religion, who has very little experience with um, mind altering substances, I was very baffled by the situation, but obviously I'm in the presence of this beautiful 
um, spirit. And the spirit has two messages for me that are very strong. One, do not fear death. Two, you must do more drugs. And the message of you must do more drugs was so shocking to me because I, as I said, I had very little drug experience. And as a child, I was actually really terrified of dr drugs. I grew up with all the you know, propaganda of the drug war. I sent Nancy Reagan a letter saying I really support the drug war. So obviously this news was very shocking. But at the same time, I had a friend who was just hammering on and on and on about therapeutic MDMA. And so as soon as I left the dentist's office and I had this message, which I wrote down, you must do more drugs, light bulb, I got to talk to my friend about MDMA. So two months later, I'm in the facilitator's apartment and I'm terrified because to take a drug was so scary to me. It was actually one of my biggest fears. Um, two of my biggest fears, drug taking, public speaking, hands down. But I decide I have to do this. This is the message. I swallow 125 milligrams of MDMA, lie on the couch, I am very scared, I'm breathing, and all of a sudden I say, I, the fear, the fear, the fear is so big. My facilitator says, Sheila, just take a couple of breaths. I take two breaths, it's like I've climbed from the, from the turbulent clouds up into that smooth place. And when I landed in that place, my inner authentic self said, Sheila, I've been waiting for you, welcome. And that, that, me took me back to a memory of my childhood when I was four years old. I was on vacation. I was left with a family friend and a very violent incident happened. Now I had no recollection of this memory up until the time that I took MDMA. And I just replayed this memory over and over and over again. I just, I was in the room. I was watching my four-year-old self in this situation. It felt very safe, even though it was a scary situation. And throughout the session, I just said, now I understand. Now I understand. And I said, thank God that I have found this medicine because I realized that this had had so many links to so much fear in my life so much uh, pain, so like panic attacks, terrible social anxiety, um, hypervigilance. If I was in a restaurant I, with friends, I'd have to choose a spot where I would feel most comfortable so I could you know, escape if I needed to, so the light wasn't on me too directly. I mean, I was really trying, I was, I was trying to survive essentially in my life. As soon as I, 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 you know, I finished the session, I thanked my facilitator immensely. The, the fear of public speaking went away immediately. I felt so much connection with my fellow human beings. I, I could have conversations that didn't involve panic attacks or being afraid. Um, and so I realized that this was really a powerful tool. And I knew that I would never have gotten to this memory without this medicine because I have done every sort of therapeutic modality that exists and nothing has ever gotten to the bottom of my anxiety. It was unbelievable. It was, and I became evangelical. I mean, my poor family, I, all I did was talk about the brilliance of MDMA. And thanks to my wonderful family, they have now all, most of them have done MDMA sessions. My second session, I knew I had to work again, was the hardest session that I ever had. Because I think when, when you grow up with trauma at, at such a young age, you really veer off path. And it's very hard to be in touch with your, you know, who you are and your whole self. And so my second session was really the about that I'm not living as my whole self and I've been kind of really off path and I chose the wrong, um, not the wrong, but my marriage wasn't a good idea and I needed to get out of my marriage. So I actually, so I, when I came out of my second session, actually, let me just jump back. In my, in my session, it said, you're at a fork in the road, you have life with your husband, you have life without your husband. And I'm gonna show you, life with your husband, barren, desert, nothing there, bleak life without your husband. I saw the most beautiful purple color I've ever seen in my life. I saw fruits, I saw beauty, I saw love, I saw thrilling excitement, like range of experiences. And so I took that, that with me out after my session, even though it was the most painful realization I had to confront and said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this marriage. And so I left the marriage. And two months after I left my marriage, I got my radio show, which is, which is what I do every week. I, I introduce 
female artists to, um, you know, to people all over the world. And it's like the love of my life. And, and I realized that like MDMA helped me be brave. Every time I do a session, it is brutal. It's hard. It's painful. I go into darkness. I, I dig up a lot of, of trauma from, from my childhood. I look at it. But then each time I do it, my life is better. And I find that as I've been doing this work, I've been doing MDMA now every year for since 2013. And by the way, when everyone talks about MDMA being a love drug and fun, it has never been that for me. And I wait the day that it is. It's always hard work for me. But I know that it is worth it because my life is so much better because of it. I, I, I'm in, I, all, most of my anxieties are gone. As I said, I feel more deeply connected to humans. I don't have the hypervigilance I used to have. And my, my life is that rich purple color that I saw in, in my second MDMA session. So now I'm just, you know, I, I'm a music person. I'm in the psychedelic community, but I don't work in the psychedelic community. So I just advocate in the places where I can to try and tell people that, you know, this work is available to you and how can I help? And I'm always so happy to speak about this, how this work has affected me. So thank you all for listening. And again, Charlie, congratulations. I'm so happy to be here with you all tonight. That was absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much, Sheila. And for everybody listening, her show is called Sophisticated Boom Boom. Fantastic title on WFMU. Um, I absolutely love that. I do remember on some of my MDMA experiences, my um, healer having to literally swipe the phone out of my hand so I wouldn't call my family and be like, you got to try this. <laughs> so I really, I really relate to that feeling of wanting to share. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next guest, who is a very impressive young man. Cacique Antonio Cuevas is co-founder and cacique or chief of an Afro-Taino village called Light of Iris Yucayeki. He is a medicine man of strong Taino lineage, originally from Puerto Rico. He's dedicated to awakening the resilient power possessed by his community and empowering them through individual and large groups for social and sacred medicine circles. And he's gracing us with his presence to talk about MDMA today. Thank you for coming, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, it's an honor to be here and a pleasure. Thank you, Charlie, for having me. Uh, I shared this story with Charlie um, once and he was like, hey, man, can you come on my on my launch and share that story? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to share that story. And uh, this, the story is, is, took place probably, probably at least 20 years ago, <laughs> maybe a little longer than that. And um, it was the, it's the, the, the time I decided to give everybody in my community probably about uh, a dozen or so people in DMA in one shot, and no one knew what it was. So um, I, I had journeyed with the medicine several times in a, in a different community before, and I came, come back to my city, and like, you guys don't know what ecstasy is. They're like, no. I'm like, you don't? They're like, no. What is it? I'm like, um, I got, I got you guys. Everybody just hold on. So I make a phone call, you know, about 30 minutes later, God pulls up and I'm like, here's one for everyone. Everyone just take one, everyone. So, <laughs> so there's probably about 12, 15 people. And I, and, um, probably didn't know what I was getting myself into at that moment. Um, but you can say about 60 minutes later after the medicine kicked in, as now I know that people were processing, people were integrating. And now I know that my role as a facilitator and instead of medicine man had to kick in not knowing that's what I was doing back then um but it was just all the different emotions from every from, from everyone in the group having you know one person real serious and like man why you didn't tell me this stuff was like this man I mean you know and I'm like you know what come over here let's have sit down here's some water have a smoke and and then um having another brother just I mean, I remember another brother of mine, and most of them are around to this day <laughs> and can tell the story. I mean, he pulled out his couch from his house and pulled out the couch and put it on the corner of the neighborhood and just sat on the couch and was like, thank you, Antonio. That feels so good, man. Just, I mean, for I mean, for eight hours, he used to sit on the couch. <laughs> he was thanking me for eight hours and, you know, had another other brother processing some really serious stuff. I got another friend of mine coming over, screaming at me, saying, man, I'm... 
is throwing life at me, but I can see it all coming. I know what I gotta do. I gotta talk to this and I gotta talk, I gotta manage right, but I can see everything happening. And he's like, um, but I'm getting real thirsty. I'm getting, I said, hey, here's some money here, get some water. Give him the money. He starts running. He starts running. Like, oh, 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 stop running. Stop running. It's throwing life at you. You don't gotta like you gotta run, run with it. And um, it was just so many different dynamics of everything going on. Um, where I, I really wasn't journeying. I, I just had to just really just jump from one group to another, to another friend, to another friend, because everyone experience was so different. You know, some people were serious, some people were processing, some people were feeling like a million bucks. Um, uh, but, but at the end of the day, uh, I mean, this is probably over 20 years ago and everyone that was there that day still remembers that story. Um, so it was a story that really changed everyone's perspective. Everyone could still look back at that day and see what the MDA made them realize about themselves, about the situation, about what they might have to change in their life. Um, you know, any reckless behavior on their behalf. Um, just so, so many epiphanies and thoughts. And um, it was just a life changing experience for everyone as a collective. And it's a, it's a beautiful memory to have. Um, was such a big group. I mean, it was so many people there. Um, you know, some of them not even around anymore, uh, but many of them are. So that that was my that's my story on MDMA um, in a group setting and just really having <laughs> having to take control of a, an entire group of people that have never done it before. Um, and um, but yeah, it, it's just been transformational experience for everyone that day and afterwards moving forward um um it's, it's, it's for me as well on a regular basis and that's that, my story that is absolutely gorgeous thank you so much antonio i really captures the exuberance of first-time users and the only thing that could possibly make that story better is your insanely beautiful voice telling it <laughs> somebody posted in the chat and i was like yes please leave my voicemail. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next guest. Uh, our next guest, you've probably seen him before. <laughs> his name is Charlie Winninger, and he's going to do another small reading from his book uh, about his own personal transformation with MDMA. Hi. Um, so uh, this reading is from the chapter about Shelley and I. Uh, and it's called Innocent Criminals. One night, after a few months of dating, Shelley started expounding on all the things she wanted to do in life. She was 49, had recently broken out of an 18 year marriage and was feeling liberated and wanting to bust out. She spoke of the places she longed to go, the things she wanted to experience. And one of these, she said, was to try ecstasy, which was what MDMA was called in 2000. I was floored. Shelly, who never so much as finished a joint in her life? <laughs> as she'd known by then, she was speaking to a man who'd been quite familiar with psychedelics and ecstasy, a, a closeted psychonaut for decades. I was by that time actually beginning to lose interest in all of it. By the time I'd met Shelly in 2000, I'd pretty much stopped tripping, tripping and essentially had sworn off MDMA. I also questioned its usefulness for anybody in any way. I didn't know of the protocols that people were putting in place at the time, how to use it right. So I had some Tuesday blues afterwards and that sort of thing. But I was soon to learn I had a woman on my hands who wanted to cut loose and explore life. She also knew of my experience and trusted me for some unknown reason. When she looked at me with all wide-eyed and innocent, longing to open up her life to a daring new adventure such as this, how could I just say no? Further, I found her interest compelling as she possessed that rare quality a fresh openness to experience that Buddhists call beginner's mind. So I agreed that MDMA might be good for her. I told her that if she really wanted to do it, I'd be willing to guide her, but I probably wouldn't be participating myself. 
I mean, who was I to stop her? Why well, not score for some for her? And okay, what the hell? I'll join her in it. So I was committed to setting up Shelley's first experience as best I could. She was putting her physical and mental chemistry in my hands, and I took the responsibility to heart. First, I had to find some. It had to be pure, which led me to an old head on the Lower East Side, who, being a true believer himself, would only sell me doses from his stash of pure MDMA if he was comfortable with me. He invited me over, so I guess he was reasonably sure I wasn't a narc. When he spoke, I felt like I was with a dad checking me out to see if my intentions with his daughter were honorable. Was this something I viewed as a recreational thrill or as a medicine to be taken seriously? How could he be sure I wasn't some sort of chemical cad? After an hour of talking about what I learned from my mushroom trip back in 95, my attending a Terrence McKenna talk in the 90s, and my admiration for Rick Doblin, I gained his confidence. Truth is, however, I eyed his stash as a medicine and a recreational thrill. I arranged to borrow my friend's country home for the weekend. After arriving, we spent the night, Shelly and I, we woke up, ate a good breakfast, and then waited about 90 minutes so our stomachs were no longer full, and we then shared our feelings and expectations with each other and dropped our little capsules. We were sitting on their balcony, facing the backyard in the delicious lushness that is upstate New York in the summertime. After waiting for what seemed like forever, Shelley started acting as if she were waking from a long sleep. This is her recollection. My kid had told me how great it was to be touched on MDMA. So as it came on, I started stroking my arms, my face and legs, feeling the sensations. I asked if it would be okay if I touched your face. I wanted to share it with you, but I asked your permission first. You said no. Oh, you're not ready. So I went back to touching myself it was sensual, not sexual. Shelly's face looked to me a picture of pure contentment. All stress drained away from her lips and her beautiful eyes. Her voice was soft and loving, and she seemed relieved it was so easy to deal with our surroundings, there being no hallucinations or the like. Then, much later, after dark, looking out into the backyard, I saw that it was warm and drizzling outside. I said, I'd like to run naked out in the rain. And so I did. Neighbors were far away. The ground felt lush and squishy under my feet. I loved it. From then on, there was no stopping her. <laughs> Shelly had previously tried mushrooms and weed with me, but MDMA, being far more user-friendly, quickly became her drug of choice. Moreover, in turning her on, I got reintroduced myself. I experienced, as if for the first time, this lift of aliveness, a kind of sensual affirmation of my spirit. I was soon to learn that each role at this time in my life would come on like a break in the battle, a corporal reward just for being alive and having made it to this point. Thank you so much, Charlie and Shelley. That was an absolutely gorgeous testament. It's really, your, your uh, trials and travails with MDMA throughout the book are just like the, the best parts of it by far. I just love Shelley's uh, open-mindedness to everything. Um, so it wouldn't be a book launch without some sort of selling of stuff. So I'm going to read a brief little holiday message for all of you. 
uh, in between our readings of transformational stories. Hey folks, it's that time of year again. Holiday time is fast approaching. So consider getting a copy of Listening to Ecstasy. It's a great stocking stuffer, next to pure MDMA itself, that is. Maybe it's right for that veteran grandpa of yours, or a curious kooky aunt. Maybe your cousin liked Michael Pollan's book. This is a way of starting a conversation with them about these marvelous medicines. And maybe next year's holiday gathering will be just a little more special. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that was my, my little ad spot for Charlie's book. Um, that is it for now. And don't forget, by the way, to stick around for a virtual book signing at the end. Rich Orloff is a playwright and storyteller. His funny, moving, and thought-provoking one-person show, It's a Beautiful Wound, about his adventures in underground therapy with MDMA and psilocybin, can be seen on YouTube by visiting beautifulwound.com or Richard, Richard, blah, sorry, richorloff.com. He's been a friend of Charlie's for over 15 years, and for the right amount of money, he'll tell you everything about Charlie that's not in the book. Here he is with a tale of three therapists. Thank you, Sarah. It's, it's so exciting to be here. Thank you, Charlie, for including me with this sort of glorious group of people. I feel like I'm the only person here I've never heard of, so um, thank you very much. Um, I've heard people say that taking MDMA once is like the equivalent of 10 years of therapy. In my experience, that's an underestimation, but it took me 20 years of therapy and three therapists to come to this conclusion. In the spring of 1985, which seems to be a very good year for several of us on the panel, just before MDMA was made illegal, I was living in Los Angeles and I had my first MDMA experience. For hours, I felt a full-bodied serenity and also awe at how well my feet were able to hold up the rest of my body. This was before MDMA became associated with dancing and partying. All of my friends who took it, took it as a way to get beyond their defenses and open their hearts. I was in therapy at the time. In LA, you need proof of therapy to renew your driver's license. And I suggested to my therapist that to help me get beyond the blocks I constantly felt, I should have a session on MDMA. My therapist, whose only experience with psychedelics was having a brother in a rock band, was not keen on the idea, but she reluctantly agreed. This being LA, the challenge was how to time taking MDMA so that it'd kick in in time for the session, but not while I was driving there. I misjudged, but by overcaution, from overcaution. I spent the whole session waiting for the medicine to kick in, anxious about what would happen, beating myself up for screwing things up and well, it was neither the set nor setting for a conducive trip. My therapist was convinced that MDMA was a waste of time. I left embarrassed, got in my car, took a free, few deep breaths, and then went on a lovely three-hour hike through the Hollywood Hills. 15 years later, now living in New York City, I was able to get my hands on some more MDMA, and so I suggested to my new therapist that I take it during one of our sessions. For months, we explored why I wanted to do this and what I hoped to get out of it. Finally, at one session, I said, I'm ready. Let's do this next week. My therapist replied, Rich, I think you'll benefit more by going through therapy without relying on a drug. I asked, why haven't you said anything about this for the last six months? He admitted that he didn't think I would ever really go through with it. I asked, and if you really think I should go through therapy without drugs, why have you been okay with me being on antidepressants? Shortly thereafter, I found a new therapist. When we first met, I asked him outright if he had had any experiences on psychedelics, and he admitted to me that he had done LSD when he was younger and he had gained from it. I liked both his, on, about, but I liked both his answer and his simple honesty. By then, I had begun reading about these MAPS experiments using MDMA to treat PTSD, and they only strengthened my belief that MDMA could help me heal from entrenched emotional pain. Eventually, I'd find an underground healer who helped people by sitting with them and supporting them through MDMA experiences, a journey which inspired my monologue, It's a Beautiful Wound, which you can see on YouTube, end of plug. But that adventure wouldn't happen for a few years. 
Although my new therapist had no experience on MDMA and no knowledge of these experiments beyond which that the things that I told him, he agreed to have a session with me being under the influence of MDMA. This time, this time I make sure to take the MDMA early enough so that by the time I arrive for the session, I am feeling it. I lie down on his couch. Usually I just sit on it. And I let my mind flow wherever it wants, sharing my thoughts along the way. A few times my therapist asks follow-up questions. And after struggling to maintain a conversation, I say, let's just see where the drug takes me. My therapist agrees. Occasionally I say something, and there are also long periods of serene silence. I've learned enough about MDMA not to let thinking get in the way of revelation. At one point, I sit up, look directly at my therapist, and I say, you know, every time I walk in here, there's a part of me that really doesn't want to like you. I not only say these words, I own them. My therapist gives the perfect response. He says, thank you. This was the most significant moment in all of my years of therapy. Without MDMA, I'm not sure I would have ever let down my defenses enough to admit that part of me to myself, let alone to my therapist. We created a bond at that moment that made me realize I didn't need to hide any part of myself from him. And how can you prog progress in therapy without that bond? Six years later, I'm still seeing that therapist. And every time an ugly thought enters my head, I kind of relish sharing it with him. He's been fully supportive of my journey in underground therapy with MDMA and psilocybin. And he's been masterful at helping me integrate the many lessons I've been given by the medicine. I really love the guy. Oh, and a part of me still really doesn't want to like him. And I can make space for that. That is what MDMA has helped me accomplish. That was absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much, Rich, for your usual customary, insanely eloquent way of describing these kinds of ineffable experiences. So here we are, time for our last guest. You guys probably don't want to hear from him. We should probably just skip over him. I don't think anybody even knows who he is. I think his name is pronounced Rock Diblin. Um, so I'll introduce him regardless. Um, Rick Doblin, PhD, is the founder and executive director of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. He received his doctorate in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. His undergraduate thesis at New College of Florida was a 25-year follow-up to the classic Good Friday experiment, experiment. Rick studied with Stanislav Grof and was among the first to be certified as a holotropic breath practitioner. He also owned a wolf and built a house by himself and also wore jean cutoff shorts. Everybody, please give a very warm MDMA welcome to the Rick Doblin. Thank you, Sarah. God, what a pleasure to be listening to all these stories of MDMA experiences. It's so wonderful. So instead of just um, telling you about research and things like that, um, I'll, I'll start by sharing some MDMA experiences that I've had. Um, and in honor of um, Alex and Allison, I'll also share about the uh, first time that Albert Hoffman ever did MDMA, <laughs> Where, uh, which took place at Esalen. But, but first, I want to say that um, it was 1982 when uh, a woman, Debbie Harlow, uh, came to Esalen. I was there doing a month-long workshop with Stan and Christina Groff, and this was after 10 years of um, preparing, trying to integrate early psychedelic experiences, where um, early on I had the delusion that the more drugs you take, the faster you evolve. And, you know, we all at some point probably wish that that were true, but there's a, a big underemphasis on the process of integration, which I didn't really appreciate. So I took a whole bunch of drugs, ended up being quite uh, mixed up, but I knew that this was the, the path for me. I just had a lot of integration to do. It took me 10 years. I then went back to study with Stan and I did this month long workshop, September, 1982 on the mystical quest. And Debbie came by, she was not part of this group, but she came by and she said, um, there's this new drug called Adam 
And it's really good. It's really good. It's being used by therapists. It helps you feel love. It helps you feel connected. It makes you a better listener. It helps you speak from the heart. And um, uh, that was interesting. Um, I saw a group of people, though, doing it, and they were sitting in a circle, and they were talking to each other. And so my, my first impression was, um, this is not that profound. You know, if, if you take a full dose of LSD, you, there's periods of time you can't even talk. You know, your ego is dissolved. You're, you're just not in a position to really have these kind of conversations. So I said, you know, how profound can it be? They're sitting, they're talking that, you know, I, I really didn't quite understand. So I was um, stupid enough to underestimate it but smart enough to buy some. <laughs> and so I, um, now while I was at Esalen also, um, on the, during the week we would practice holotropic breath work. And you know, that, that was appropriate. That's what we were there for. But on the weekends without Esalen or Stan's permission, um, we would go off somewhere and uh, sit for each other with LSD or things like that. And so there was this uh, woman that was uh, about my age that was in the workshop and I was attracted to her, um, but I did have a girlfriend back home that I was in love with. And so um, she asked me to sit for her for her first experience with LSD. And uh, I did that. And it was, it was very intimate to be sitting for somebody when their ego is dissolving and all, but there was, there was nothing sexual going on with us, but there was this attraction. The, LSD experience went really, really well. And then afterwards, as a present, she gave me this uh, gold necklace as a, as a token of appreciation. So I was wearing that. Um, and then I, um, the workshop got over and I came home. And so, uh, and I said to my girlfriend, um, I've got this MDMA that I've heard about, uh, you know, maybe we should try it together. And so we did. And the thing that was so um, impressive to me was how we were able to talk about this um, relationship, this attraction that I had for this other woman. And that it, even though it wasn't sexual, it was just something that we were able to um, communicate about in a very open-hearted, non-defensive way, something that could have easily triggered a lot of jealousy, a lot of difficulty. And I just felt like we were able to communicate in such a defenseless, open-hearted, loving, accepting way that we could navigate a difficult emotional territory with grace. And it just felt really wonderful. And then we started talking about how much we loved each other. And I'd say the main thing that I remember from that session is that we said to each other, this is not the drug talking. This love that we're expressing for each other, it's coming from within us. The drug is helping us to express it and to communicate it, but it's not like a delusion. It's not like this drug that you're in love and then afterwards you're not. It just felt like we were establishing um, the ability to communicate in such a, a, a beautiful way. And it did have these long and lasting implications. So from that first experience, I, I learned really how profound it was and how subtle of a shift it was from normal awareness. And what that meant is that it's easier to integrate because your ego isn't dissolved. You can kind of take these lessons and these open-hearted ways of communicating, and you can move that into your uh, daily life. It takes a lot of work to do that, but it's possible to do that, that, that this was a tool that was easier to integrate than um, LSD or, or classic psychedelics, and I felt that it had enormous uh, therapeutic potential. Um, and it was 1984, uh, several years later, that I had a chance to work with a PTSD patient. And I, I've spoken about this in my <laughs> TED Talk, so I, I won't really uh, speak about it much now. But just to say that um, it was 1984 that I really learned that MDMA can be tremendous for PTSD. And also it was the time that um, Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan and the escalation of the drug war and trying to criminalize MDMA. And so 
with Debbie Harlow and a woman, Elise Agar, we started a nonprofit before MAPS to try to protect MDMA. And in the summer of 84, DEA moved to criminalize it and we were prepared and we sort of filed, I filed the request for a hearing, which we got. And so the um, publicity about um, that was was going and, and we had these series of meetings at Esalen to um, gather the psychedelic community and prepare for these uh, uh, challenging lawsuits. And Albert Hoffman came to one of these meetings that we had at Esalen and he had never tried MDMA. So we had a, a small group that was um, Sasha Shulgin, Dave Nichols, um, myself, uh, George Greer, uh, Debbie Harlow, Elise Agar, um, and we all did MDMA together. And the thing that was initially so amazing to me was that um, this conversation between Sasha Shulgin and Dave Nichols and Albert about the molecular nature of chemistry. And it was this um, very incredible sense of, of how they could see atoms and putting together atoms in different ways. Um, and it, it was this beautiful um, joy that they had about playing with matter. But then it switched into very dark moments because what Dave, um, Nichols started sharing was that in order to um, pay his way through graduate school, he actually worked on the stability of nuclear weapons. And he had to test the, uh, whether they were still, uh, I'm not sure exactly what he was testing, but he, he was working on nuclear weapons. And so it moved from the atomic nature of chemistry to produce psychedelic molecules to uh, uh, atomic weaponry. And this thought that uh, you know perhaps we could really be destroying the world with this same kind of power that that getting at that level gives us power to create but power to destroy and and that was a very kind of a dark period of this uh, experience and after we kind of got through that for a bit then um, we all kind of closed our eyes and, and sort of went inner just to have this kind of um, period of time of reflection and processing. And so, uh, and I remember uh, Debbie Harlow was massaging Albert's feet and he was just having this, and uh, Elise was massaging his hands and it was just this incredible situation. And then out of this silence, um, which was lasted for a while, Albert comes out and he, he speaks to us and he says, finally, something I can do with my wife. <laughs> because uh, Anita, so this is on the theme, uh, Charlie and Shelley, about uh, doing ecstasy together as part of a couple, too, because uh, Anita had only taken um, LSD once and had a difficult trip, and she didn't really like it, and that was always a problem for Albert. Now, this was, um, you know, 40 years after he had first had his experience with LSD, and he'd never been able to really do drugs with his wife after this first LSD trip. So that was his first thought that he really could express to us now, finally, something I can do with my wife. Um, so just, just really beautiful, that sense of how she could handle it, that it would be something that she could process, that they could share together. Um, now, a few months later, after that experience, which was really inspiring, um, and we're in the middle of the lawsuits, um, so that's when I got um, contacted by Julie Holland. She's, she'd read about the work that we were doing, uh, trying to protect the therapeutic use of MDMA, and so she contacted me, and, um, and so I was able to visit her, and when I was visiting her, I, I was also carrying uh, an image writer and an old Mac, uh, the big old... Uh, early max that, um, so I would be um, working while I was traveling. I, I'd keep my printer and my computer. And so um, during this uh, experience that uh, Julie and I were having together and we were talking about things, that there was um, this imminent criminalization of MDMA coming up. And there was a um, Business Week article that had been about uh, MDMA and it talked a little bit about it. And I was working on a, a letter to the editor and so near the end of this um, experience where I could manipulate a typewriter and things, the computer, 
um, I started working on this uh, letter to the editor and I had this um, conclusion of it. And it was about how sad it was that MDMA was going to be criminalized, um, but that I hoped in the future one day uh, the therapy use, the legal therapeutic use of MDMA could become more than a dream. And I got it all set, and then I decided to print this out so I could put it in the uh, in the mail. And then somehow or other, the printer um, went haywire, and all it printed out on one page was become more than a dream. And I thought, wow, now I saved that. So this is framed by my desk. Let's see, I don't know if you can read this. It's kind of fade because it says become, um, become more than a dream. So this has been by my um, desk now for uh, 35 years. Um, to remind me that, that the therapeutic use of MDMA needs to become more than a dream. Now, again, in honor of uh, Charlie and Shelley and this idea of couples, what I wanted to share is that um, we have been trying for 30 years to educate the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense about MDMA therapy. Um, the VA pays for therapy, but they also pay for disability. So they're the group, most insurance companies pay for your treatment, but if you're disabled, there's some other group that pays for the disability. So the Veterans Administration has the most incentive of any group in America to explore MDMA therapy, because if we can help people not have PTSD, it's a million, million and a half dollars lifetime cost of disability for somebody that goes on uh, disability for, for any, for PTSD. And there's over a million vets that are on disability for PTSD right now. We estimate it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 billion a year that the VA spends every year. So as part of our effort to educate the VA and the stigma of MDMA has been a problem, it's becoming less so, but um, we felt that we needed to take the VA researchers and pay for them to develop, to, to study non-drug psychotherapies that they have developed for PTSD and blend MDMA with them. And we, it took us with, through the help of Richard Rockefeller and his um, cousin, Senator Jay Rockefeller, who was on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, this is about seven years ago, before Richard died in a plane crash, he, he um, was tremendously helpful to us. Um, and we had these meetings all throughout the Pentagon and the um, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs throughout the VA. And we had this big meeting with the Department of Defense and the VA, and they suggested finally that they would let one of their researchers work with us. And since they heard about MDMA as the, the love drug, the hug drug, there's a therapy called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. So it's, it's um, a lot of cognitive behavioral techniques, but conjoint means couples or dyads, where one of them has PTSD, but it affects the relationship. And so that was the one that we were gonna blend MDMA with. And both of the people in the dyad or the couple get MDMA. So it's a way for us to be looking still at PTSD, but it's kind of a backdoor into uh, couples therapy. The, the problem with um, the way our system is set up and why we're so interested in both medicalization and drug policy reform is that one of the best uses of MDMA is couples therapy, is relationships but you can only medicalize a drug for the treatment of a disease. So couples therapy is not like a disease. We can't really get approval from FDA to make MDMA into a medicine for couples therapy. So this kind of cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy is um, sort of a way to do couples therapy. So about two and a half months ago, Candace Monson, who did the study and I presented to the Boston VA and I presented our phase two results and where we were at with phase three. And she presented the, the story about blending MDMA with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. But she showed all of the studies and the effect size, the magnitude of the treatment effect of all of the studies that she had done without MDMA to develop cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD. And those were, were pretty good. And then she showed um, the effect size of when you add MDMA to cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy and it was better than any of the other studies that she had done without MDMA. So what's so important about this is that the largest group in the world of PTSD researchers 
and therapist is called the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies. And Candace is now the president of that group. And she's interested in doing another larger, bigger study with this. So we are starting to educate the DA um, and we're about to make major breakthroughs with Rachel Yehuda at the Bronx VA. So we have FDA approval. We have what's called a CRADA, um, which is a collaborative research and development agreement with the Bronx VA. So I'm so used to thinking of the government as, you know, the drug war and, you know, trying to squash and I, they're the predators and I'm the prey and we have to be careful. <laughs> um, but to have these collaborative, uh, cooperative research agreements with the VA, um, it's pretty great. So we think by early next uh, year, we'll be able to start the first MAP sponsored study inside the VA. And there's just more and more people in the uh, military and the Department of Defense that are paying attention to this. Um, it's been destigmatized enough. And what most people have recognized, and, and we've talked about it briefly, is that the drugs won the election. <laughs> yeah. Drug policy reform won the election. Um, all of the marijuana medicalization and legalization, the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, legalized. Uh, lowest enforcement priority for plant medicines. So we're in an incredible situation that uh, I think we really can um, bring all of this forward and uh, make all of this more than a dream. And I would say that it depends so much on public education. So to get back to uh, uh, listening to Ecstasy and your, your book, um, people need to know first off that it's relevant to them. And we all have relationships. We all have challenges with um, expressing ourselves, with being good listeners. So I, I think the kind of public education that um, can be done by your book and you guys coming out of the closet and taking whatever risks there are of people, you know, knowing that you've had this these series of experiences with MDMA, that we need to prepare the public for this emergence of the medicalization and eventually legalization of psychedelics. And I think talking about how MDMA can help with relationships is one of the most powerful tools that we have for educating and changing people's minds and opening them up to the changes that are coming. And um, I'll say again to Alex and Nelson, you know, art is another one of these ways that, that you can apprehend where other people have been through appreciating uh, the art that's been created. And, you know, book is also a form of art. You know, a novel is also a form of art. So I think all these different ways we have been able to take a culture that was terrified 50 years ago by the potential of psychedelics, by the loss of control that people have, by the kind of experiences that people um bring to the surface that they don't know how to integrate. And we had, a, uh, and also by when it goes right, how people have this unit of mystical experience and that motivates them for political action. And then you see you're connected to nature, you're, you're connected to people that are different from you. So the culture backlash um, was so strong, but I think 50 years later now, we are in a really good position. The culture has really matured through so much of the work that um, all of us and many, many others have done. Um, over the last 50 years that I really think that if we are careful, we will be able to mainstream psychedelics without the backlash. And I think that is our challenge. And I, I think that we're up to the challenge and the need is great. Humanity is in a situation where it needs to be more spiritualized or we're gonna destroy the environment and destroy each other. And so what do we need? We need more love. And that's what listening to ecstasy is about. <laughs> Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm like horse now. <laughs> thank you so much, Rick. I have to say, um, I had a betting pool before you started speaking about what you would do on this call. And um, in the running was um, go for two hours. The other one was take a controlled substance during the talk. And then the third one was show pictures of your wolf. Um, but nobody actually had bet on what actually happened, which is asking 200 people to keep a secret. Right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see if uh, trust is worthwhile or not. Uh, if, you know, but I think this is the kind of group that uh, can be trustworthy. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody, you you're sworn to pinky swearing. <laughs> By I need you to pinky swear in the chat. 
to <laughs> confirm that you're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Rick. Um, it is absolutely a joy to hear your stories about um, Albert Hoffman tripping with Sasha Shulgin. That's like <laughs> hearing like Socrates tripping <laughs> with like Leonardo da Vinci or something. There's, people feel like more historical figures rather than, um, oh, look at all the pinky squares. Look, okay. <laughs> this is great. Okay, thank you. It's so many, yeah, pinky swear. All right. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna bring it back to the author to tell us how he is going to virtually sign all of your books. Oh, yes. Um... Yeah, uh, you know, at this time of, uh, first of all, I just have to say thank you, Rick. That was such a beautiful uh, talk. And uh, um, it really touched me. And, um, you know, you're my hero. So uh, the work that you're doing, if, if you didn't do this work, there would be no book. Uh, uh, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't be able to do the book without getting thrown in jail, I'll tell you that. Um, so you're keeping me free. <laughs> uh, and me too. <laughs> uh, so I've been uh, saying, how can I sign your book? You know, this is a book signing, a book launch. And uh, people generally come to a book launch to get their book signed. And, you know, they go up to the author, they buy the book, they go up to the author, they say, sign it this way. And, and they have a book signed. So I say, how can we do this at a virtual event and during the time of COVID and, and, and all of it? I figured out how, it's kind of obvious. Um, what I'm inviting you to do, anyone who wants to, is email me your physical address. And, uh, and, and I promise I will use it only once. I'm not gonna sell your address to anybody. I'm never gonna use it again. But if you do so, um, and, and you tell me uh, in that email, uh, you give me a physical address and tell me how you want the book signed. I will then take one of these book plates and uh, sign my name. If you, I don't know if you can see that. Sign my name, mail it to you. And then, uh, where, where was the- uh... It's a little difficult to open. Oh yeah. But... And then you, you'll, you'll get it in the mail and you'll, tear off the back sticker, the back, and, and be able to stick right into the inside cover of your copy. And that's how I can sign your book. So uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you and uh, being able to sign your book any way you want. The great magic trick is revealed. And uh, Monica has put his email address in the chat, by the way. It's just cjwinninger at gmail.com. Uh, easier to remember. So I'm going to call upon uh, Administrator Monica's uh, technological prowess to throw us to some Q and A's. I think maybe let's just do 10 minutes of Q and A's if possible. Um, so all you New Yorkers will have an hour to hang out before the curfew goes down. Um, so Monica, if you have any, um, guests who want, or, uh, attendees who want to ask a question of the panel, please bring okay. them to the screen. I summon, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nayla Mason, if you are available to become a panelist and ask your question live, please raise your hand or put in the chat that that's a yes. Why don't we offer a couple of people while, because some people may have need to turn in. Oh no, she's here. Oh, she's sweet. She's here. Okay. Kayla, Let's for the win. Her. You are now a panelist, Nayla. Where is she? Did you, are you there? Not here. Ah. Wait, I can't see her. Do you see her? Hello. Okay, I'm going to change the speaker view. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Um, I would like to ask a question uh, to all of you, but mainly this is something that uh, Rick, you touched upon. Um, so I'm an undergraduate student, I'm extremely thankful for all the pioneering that you've all done so that I can someday progress the research um, in the healing powers of psychedelics. Um, I've been inspired by my subjective experience, maps, and the work of Dr. Ben Sessa. 
Um, and I'm interested in studying the potential of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for people with developmental trauma from childhood abuse. Um, so my question is, how can we work within the current system to heal people who do not necessarily fall under a certain category in the DSM? Um, do you, we strive for, to add more disorders such as complex PTSD um, and DTD, or do you think we're perhaps due for a complete psychiatric revolution? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll say we are due for a complete psychiatric re revolution, and it's underway. Um, about two months ago, or well, about three months ago now, I was invited to um, give a talk to UMass Worcester Medical School, and it was by the psychiatric residents, and they want to start a lecture series about psychedelics. And so um, when I got the invitation, I was really delighted, because I know that the the next president, who's now the current president of the American Psychiatric Association, was on their faculty. So I asked if after my talk, he could um, be part of a discussion and he agreed to do this, Jeffrey Geller. And then um, Paul Summergrad, who is a former president of the American Psychiatric Association is head of psychiatry at Tufts here in Boston also. I asked if he could be part of the discussion afterwards and he agreed. So it was just amazing to have after my talk, the current and former president of the American Psychiatric Association say that psychedelics are the wave of the future for psychiatry. Um, we do enroll people with, um, with complex trauma. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard this part, but um, we would now do work with 18-year-olds um, or over. So that's what our phase three is. There's no upper age limit because it's not about um, age, it's about health, and we can only go down to 18-year-olds. But the FDA is requiring us, if we succeed in adults, to do work with traumatized adolescents. So we, we have to do studies with 12 to 17 year olds. If that works, we have to go down to seven to 11 year olds. And so I think that that's gonna be some of the most important work that gets done because if you can treat people closer to the trauma, that it will be easier, less expensive, and you'll avoid much more time of suffering. So I think trying to um, think about um, how might you, let's say, prepare yourself for doing that kind of work um, the, the best preparation, I, I think, is two parts. One part is to do work with um, children who are traumatized, just with whatever therapies are available. Just get used to that population uh, and how to work with them in more traditional ways. And then the other thing is to um, have your own experiences and to sit for your friends, so to have your own experiences and, and sit for your friends and just sort of see how these things can be used in a therapeutic setting. And our treatment manual of our therapeutic approach is up on the MAPS website for anybody to download and free. Um, and I don't know if you've heard about the octopus study, do you know? Oh, okay, well, I'll just say, this is why I think it's gonna work in kids. So um, a neuroscientist, Gould Dolan at Johns Hopkins um, is doing all sorts of um, neuroscience studies with MDMA. Um, it turns out that octopuses and humans diverged around 550 million years ago, something like that. But octopuses still process serotonin. So even though their brains are different, now octopuses are solitary creatures, unless it's mating season, which is not that much of the time. So octopuses spend almost all their time by themselves. And there's this experimental uh, procedure where they put them in a, a a box sort of, and there's two doors, one going in each direction. In one side, there's another octopus in a little cage so the other octopus can't move. And then the other is an inanimate object, like a ball also in this cage so it can't move. So the octopus that can move, that's in the center, spends way more time with the inanimate object. And when it's in the chamber with the other octopus, it stays around the perimeter. It doesn't really approach it. So they, they, it took them a while to experiment. We sent them a bunch, well, we sent them some MDMA. And so they figured out that they could put the MDMA in the water. They soak the octopus in the MDMA water for 10 minutes and the octopus absorbs the MDMA and then they put it back in the experimental chamber. And now all of a sudden, the octopus spends way more time with the other octopus and not just around the perimeter, but sort of uh, touching their tentacles together. And beforehand, they would switch this out with the genders. No matter how they switch the genders, the octopus would spend more time with the inanimate object. But once they um, give the octopus MDMA, again, regardless of the gender, they'll spend more time with the other octopus. 
So the pro-social open-hearted aspects of MDMA go really deep evolutionary and they are pre-verbal. So I think that even if we start working with 11, seven to 11 year olds or kids who have language, but don't really have the ability to articulate a lot of what's going on, that the effects will still work. So we are very much looking forward to that kind of work. Um, and so I, I do think that it's great that you want to do that because because that in some ways is some of the most painful work too to see kids that have been abused and you know try and see how that so alters how they process and to be able to help them is is great. Um, and as far as this uh, revolution in psychiatry, um, maybe we should have Julie say some words about that. But uh, we definitely need it. <laughs> maybe you damn well should. Yes, I would say there there's definitely a much needed revolution that needs to happen in psychiatry. And lately when I've been talking about MDMA and psilocybin and ayahuasca and ibogaine, I've been sort of thinking of them as like disruptive medicines and disruptive technologies. And they're really going to allow us uh, to help people sort of more effectively and more efficiently. And I also feel like it's gonna end up being a, a group model over time, you know, that will be sort of cost effective and it also helps people to create community. So that's my idea. Uh, well, not my idea. That's my thoughts. That's my two cents. If we talk any longer, I'm gonna have to charge you a lot more. Can I say something about that? Um, about uh, the group model, there's a, a, a section of, uh, of, of my book at the end of uh, the guide to safe use uh, about group experiences. And these are not, I'm not talking about therapeutic experiences where people are getting together to heal uh, trauma or anything else. It's just uh, friends getting together to do MDMA. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've, I've been, and some strangers, yes. Uh, but the people were chosen very carefully. And I've been to several of these. And the group experience with MDMA is a whole different animal. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's like having your bliss magnified and squared. Uh, it's bliss squared is what it is uh, for the day. Having the right people and a group experience uh, for the day with no other agenda than to just see what happens. Yeah. And um, it's been among the most ecstatic experiences of our lives. Oh, thank you all so much for that. Thank you so much, um, Nalia, or Nala. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I, I should have said that in the beginning. Nala. Okay, got it. Thank you. I think we should maybe do one more question um, just to cap things off. So, Monica, is anybody else um, available to uh, come on screen to ask their question? Yes, I have just promoted Ronnie. Uh, I'm not going to try the last name. Uh, to a panelist. It's harmless. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> hi, hi, Charlie. Hi, Shelly. It's so good to see you all. Um, wow, what an honor to like see this group of people here. It just like makes my face hot because I don't even. <laughs> it's just uh, such an amazing group, and um thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask a question um my question is with the with mdma and um you know recently with ketamine becoming more of a widely known drug um chemical drug uh how do you foresee regulating that with pharmaceutical companies and them not you know, turning them into uh, drugs like Xanax and like other benzodiazepines and opiates, like where it's not, uh, where they where where it becomes money making, um, just exploit exploiting the drug um, for money making purposes. How do you foresee that um, in the market with pharmaceutical companies? And um, if it's okay, I had a kind of a second part question. Um, I just finished my program to, uh, I'm transitioning to, ther to becoming a therapist. I just finished my program. So um, I'm in that transition process right now. And what uh, precautions would you say as a new 
as a novice therapist, like coming into the field, um, do you have any uh, words of advice, I guess, as uh, things that I should be taking note of as a new therapist working with people on this topic? Um, and, you know, wanting to be a little more open about it myself and where I should hold back or where I can be more uh, upfront. That's my question. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so which of the panelists wants to take this one first? Also, I think I'm off of spotlight video. So Rick. Okay, I'll take the first part and then other people can answer the second part. Um, so the first part is how do we protect against, uh, you know, big pharma coming in and exploiting MDMA? So um, we are the pharmaceutical company. So MAPS is going to be marketing MDMA. Um, so we have MAPS as the nonprofit, and then we have the MAPS Public Benefit Corp, which is the for-profit, because marketing MDMA for a profit is taxable. But it's a for-profit that has only one investor, which is the nonprofit. And so our mission is to um, maximize patient outcomes and work on public benefit. And at the same time, what we're trying to do is do work with drug policy reform, so people have other ways to get these drugs without having to go through medicine or religion that in a kind of licensed legalization context that will take a while to set up. I think we'll need a decade or so of psychedelic clinics where thousands and thousands of these clinics will be set up and then more and more people will hear stories of people that have had positive uh, therapeutic outcomes and that'll change everybody's attitudes and then we'll end up with a licensed legalization system. So the challenge for us is going to be, you know, where do we set the price of MDMA? But the, the thing that makes it so it'll never become like Xanax or, or like SSRIs is that the drug is not the treatment, it's the therapy. And the drug helps the therapy be more effective. So we have to make these agreements with FDA about, and also with DEA, about how the drug is regulated post-approval. And those are called REMS, Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies. So the main thing will be that the only people that can treat patients are people that have been through the training program to learn the therapy that was used in the phase three studies. The therapists can still innovate and modify. You know, they don't have to use the exact method we teach them, but they have to be taught about the therapy approach. And it can only be administered under direct supervision. So that's where it's fundamentally different than ketamine. Ketamine for depression is a pharmacological treatment that is administered without therapy. It would work better with therapy, but the pharma companies, they don't know about therapy. They just know about drugs. So I think the REMS will prevent um, it from being exploited. And the fact that we're gonna be marketing it in a public benefit maximizing company owned by a nonprofit. So we've had um, over a hundred million dollars worth of donations over the 34 years of MAPS, which is kind of astonishing. And that's what makes it so we don't have to return a penny to any investors. It's not about that. And particularly when investors do this kind of risky stuff, like trying to make drug into a medicine, they want a lot of return for those ones that succeed. So anyway, that, I think that those concerns will, um, those worries are, are legitimate, but I think we can avoid having them come into being. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think we can go to the next. Well, question. her second question was about the training, right? Oh, right. I was going to actually throw to Charlie on this. Um, uh, Charlie, do you have anything to answer on the second question about the training? Uh, could you uh, give me the question again? Ronnie, do you want to repeat your Yeah, question? it was just um, as a new therapist, uh, and now that the language and, you know, the topic of psychedelic education and psychedelics being used in therapy is becoming more mainstream and, um, you know, re-educating the public on it, but just because it's not quite there yet, <laughs> like how, uh, how cautious should new or just in general, should we be as uh, clinicians when talking about the use of the uh, of psychedelics with? We're talking about the use of psychedelics with who? 
with clients or oh, with clients? Oh, oh. Um, well, I still err on the side of caution myself um, because, um, uh, first of all, that I, I I'm in the closet with most of my clients because it's it's not. Why did they have to learn about my private life? Um, if they find me online, that's, you know, and see often that people are telling me, oh, I see you wrote a book. Um, uh, but if they don't uh, know about my, my use, I don't tell them because it's not, it's not then I'm making the therapy about me. Um, uh, so uh, I, but when it comes to uh, people who are, I think could benefit from it, uh, the best, thing I do, I'm still pretty cautious. I, I, I might bring it up and say, well, the, there is research out there that shows that, et cetera, that, that um, it could be of use to, to you for your particular issue. You might want to look into it. Mm -hmm. And you might want to read Michael Pollan's book, for example. That's, that's, the, that's the type of thing I would, that type of conversation I would have. Great, thank you, Charlie. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ronnie. Um, all right, so I'm gonna call upon the wizarding prowess of Monica once again. Um, Hi. For another, we're gonna do a couple more questions um, since we have a bunch of people still watching. Um, so I, um, we had a question, she did not respond to being becoming a panelist. So I'll just read the question because I thought it was interesting. Why would someone who has never tried MDMA before or is potentially uninterested benefit from reading this book? It's that. Why would they benefit from it? Well, uh, of course, the book is not just about, it's not just a chemical love story, it's a love story. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a story about how Shelley and I went ventured into a, a land, a, a world of, of uh, a forbidden world of, of drug users and found it to be enchanted. Uh, it's, it's also a story about um, uh, the aging process and there's a whole chapter called Senior High. Um, and it's all about how uh, I, I, I used MDMA to help me through the, uh, the aging process, but even if you don't want to use MDMA and you have you know, no, no desire to use it, it's, uh, you, you might be interested in the chapter because I'm talking about that the, the, the real problem with age isn't, age isn't aging, it's ageism. It's, uh, it's the devaluing of people as they get older uh, and how, uh, I mean, I. <laughs> I write about a client who came to me who said like, I, uh, I, I can't get out of my relationship. My, my, uh, my, uh, it's a monogamous relationship, but she's cheating on me all the time. And I, I, can't, I can't leave her no matter what I do because I know if I'm single again, I will never find another person uh, to love me at my age. He's 32 years old. That's ageism, where you believe that past age 25, your value is, 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 is going down. Um, so I talk a lot about uh, the, uh, the, the insidious effects of ageism in, all, in our lives, even at, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and how we can confront that. And Shelley and I have uh, live the life where we don't live according to other people's idea of what it should be, what it should look like to grow older. We, uh, we, we do it our way and uh, we've been much better off for it. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you so much for that. Um, okay, once again, I don't know if I'm showing up on Spotlight, but anyway, the mysterious voice from the void. Um, Monica, can you, um, take us to uh, another question. Uh, I, yes, I've just promoted Will Meyerhofer. <gasps> hey guys. Do you hey, Will I'll, Meyerhofer? You guys caught me in my PJs here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really enjoying it. It's really fun. It's great. I love this. Carly talks hey, about the book, you know, the community. Hey, well. like, the most incredible part of this whole thing, you know. I mean, I mean, it's not the most incredible part of this, but it's sort of an unexpected and wonderful part of it. Is is all of you guys? Um, 
question is really, um, I guess sort of specific. It's just, uh, I've had a couple of neat experiences with MDMA, um, kind of life-changing, wonderful experiences. Um, also have used LSD and uh, psilocybin and found them to be very powerful. Um, I've heard tell that you can combine them. And uh, I'm just curious uh, whether, you know, I mean, we haven't really, I guess no one's mentioned that tonight. I hope no one's mentioned that tonight. But I was just curious, uh, you know, what people thought of that. Great question. Candy flipping and hippie flipping. So let's see, Charlie or Rick or actually anybody on this call. Anyone want to cover that one? Oh, the grays look like they want to answer this one. Um, can you guys unmute yourself? Great. Well, uh, we, we have enjoyed that a great deal, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> That's our normal sort of way to go, actually, is, a, is, a, is an LSD MDMA cocktail. Although mushrooms and MDMA sounds good to me. You are actually just straight MDMA experiences, although we, each one being extremely memorable, right? Absolutely, but um, a very um, powerful um, allies, I think, and uh, each can potentiate the other. Uh, they, they, you might uh, uh, be very frightened of some of the visions that might come up uh, on LSD. Uh, with MDMA, there's more of a ability to maintain the witness and uh, and compassionate witness and of the flow uh, I think in an extraordinary way and I think it's they're kind of accelerants in some ways uh, for it, each other. I think it cuts the fear and terror you know like I think that although I've, I've had some incredible LSD experiences with the terror is very much a teacher and very important but I do think that the MDMA eases you from the concern of having terror it's just uh, Alton can you say visions, these incredible visuals what do you think here well I was going to ask you can you say how you sequence them like the LSD and the MDMA is there LSD a first longer yeah like and like maybe an hour or two later then okay i'll tell you there are some mixtures that i wouldn't recommend but i'm sure that you all have have those kinds of uh uh experimentation as well but but that but those two that you asked about i think are 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 great combinations they are actually in the sacred mirror frames that we sculpted together in the very last frame of, of the technological evolution, there's a brain, which is high technology. And on one side is the chemical formula of LSD, and on the other one is MDMA. So uh, they were, well, they were life altering for us. They helped found the sacred mirror whole thing, you know, so. And then the chapel. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, in therapy, I also like that the LSD first and then a couple hours later, the MDMA. So you have kind of the hard part and then the MDMA helps with the integration. And I can say from personal experience that, well, one, there's a value to them independently just to get to know them, for me, to get to know them first. But yeah, there was one time on psilocybin where it took me to a place of primal terror and the MDMA just allowed me to stay there. I mean, I was in the terror, but it was like, yeah, I'm in the terror, as odd as that sounds. And it, um, I'm not sure at that point in my growth, I could have tolerated it without the MDMA. Uh, thanks, I can, I can find, I, I found that when I, if we do MDMA first and then LSD, it puts me in a dream world, a lovely, lovely dream world. Uh, personally, Mushrooms and, L and MDMA, I don't like, but that's me. It's very individual. Everyone is, has a I agree, it's very individual. Yeah, of Sorry, course. Sorry, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Right, just, I was just that. going to, oh, okay. sorry, guys. I was just going to add the, as confirmation of how individual it is. Um, I recognize that bed uh, extremely well that Will is sitting on because 
I had to lay there for a good three hours and was unable to move my body because MGMA was so powerful. Um, I'll let the attendees wonder what I was doing in Will's bed. But uh... <laughs> it's a Japanese kimono fabric. And it actually has, it depicts little tiny bunny rabbits. Oh, we had a friend make that for us. Uh, well, I find it hard to, to combine them for that reason, but um, that it's a great question. Um, did anybody else? I think everybody actually answered that question. Um, unless Monica, our administrator, do you have any? Oh, no, Antonio and Sheila didn't. Do you guys have strong thoughts about this? Um, yeah, I could add to that. Um, MDMA definitely synced with the heart opening of the chakra from the MDMA. Definitely seems to make um, a psilocybin or LSD journey more um, enjoyable. I don't know if that's the right word <laughs> um, because I, I'm perfectly fine without com combining. But um, definitely the MDMA heart chakra opening seems to make a psilocybin journey or a high dose uh, acid journey more uh, comfortable and, and enjoyable. Um, because if anybody knows with high dose LSD or high dose psilocybin, you can put you in some dark places. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely true. Sheila, did you have any uh, thoughts about combining? I will add that I have never combined MDMA with anything because I've only ever done MDMA. I'm still a beginner on this journey and that's just brought up so much for me. So I'm sticking with the MDMA solo for now. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I don't know why my, camp, my spotlight won't go back on, but yes, I figured it out. <laughs> okay, spotlight, hooray. Um, I think this about wraps it up on this high note of combining. Can I say one thing, Sarah, to Ronnie's question? Yeah. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been in practice for about uh, 16 years or so. And um, a lot at this point in my career, I'm a former corporate attorney on Wall Street. And a lot of my uh, clients are from the corporate legal world and uh, from the finance world. And uh, so they're pretty buttoned down folks. And so the issue of whether to come out of the closet about psychedelics uh, to them has kind of, however, been taken care of because they all sort of hint to me that they use them. And all I have to say is, oh, great, psychedelics. Yeah, I think they're terrific. And, and it's, I, just, I had a corporate attorney in Singapore who runs, you know, the legal department of major corporations sort of hint to me that maybe he smoked DMT and maybe he and his wife took LSD and maybe they used MDA together, MDMA. And uh, I just said, oh, wonderful. And that was, I was out of the closet. So it, they're coming to me. I mean, it's not really like, you know, is wacky, crazy therapist going to come out of the closet? It's more like, oh, such a relief. I can talk about psychedelics with this guy, you know? And these are, I, I swear to God, legal folks from top corporations posted mm -hmm. internationally. So, um, you know, go now, right? Thanks, Will. Oh, wow, that, is <laughs> that was cool. helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Will's calling from his bed, truly one of the troopers <laughs> staying, <laughs> staying late for this event, really quite a trooper. So I think um, I do want to make sure everybody can go to bed at a reasonable hour. Um, and so I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank, um, you know, I want to thank Rich, Allison, Alex. I want to thank all the question askers. I want to thank Monica for administrating, Sheila, Antonio. I want to thank Rick, of course. I want to thank Charlie. And of course, I want to thank Shelly. Thank you guys so much for being here. Charlie, do you have any final parting words? Um, <laughs> she said, buy, tell them to buy your book. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, no, this has been uh, just a, a, a gorgeous uh, night for me. And it was so, such a pleasure uh, arranging this and coming up with this crazy idea to do a book launch this way uh and um i'd like to say something uh, i'm i'm so grateful to all of you who participated and, and sarah for uh for, for for doing this uh and lending your uh, effervescent spirit to the proceedings um so um can so i I'm say something grateful. yes please i want to say something if it weren't if it weren't for covid and the fact that we had to do this virtually we never would have gotten Allison and Alex and Rick and Rich and and 
Sarah and Antonio and Sheila, we and Will and everybody, we never would have gotten all of you and Julie never would have gotten all of you in the same place at the same time. Let's yeah. face it. Yeah. So there's a silver lining to yeah. uh, to, to bad things. As a, as a my old supervisor said, the flower of heaven blooms in hell. Mm. That's absolutely gorgeous. All right. On that note. Thank everybody. Thank you everybody for joining. And uh, hopefully Charlie will write another book really soon so we can do this again. <laughs> okay, bye guys. Bye.